Hey guys, and welcome to the second video in my multi-part series on how to study words to become a better tournament Scrabble player. Now, I think this video will be fairly brief. Basically, what I'm going to show you is my recommended sequence of word study for new and then gradually intermediate and then advanced tournament players. And uh, I'll be diving more deeply into why I recommend the order I do in later videos as I show you how to study each specific list. But basically, I just want to give you a overview of the different word lists we'll be talking about in the rest of the series, and also just go over a few important definitions. So this here is the order I recommend. I always recommend that folks start with the twos, as, as you can see, there's only 100 of them, so it's not a particularly lengthy list to learn, and they are so, so important to have down really solid before you move on to anything else. After that, I generally recommend players move on to the threes, starting with the most useful threes, which I'll explain in just a minute, and then after that, moving on to all of the threes. There's about a thousand threes in the current version of the dictionary, so it's a bit more of a substantial list than the twos. It'll take a little bit longer to learn these, but once you know the twos, it'll be super useful to know the threes, especially since many threes are built directly off of twos by hooking a letter onto either side. After that, I typically recommend uh, starting the four letter words, especially with the most useful ones, and then uh, jumping a little bit from the shorter words into bingos, since uh, bingos, especially seven and eight letter words, are really, really useful for scoring a lot of points if you do have the right tiles. And uh, I find that a lot of newer tournament players, and uh, by this point you're probably still a fairly new tournament player and slowly rising in the ranks, a lot of newer tournament players really haven't studied any bingos, so having a even small knowledge of some obscure bingos will give you an edge over those players. Once you've got down uh, some of the most important bingos, then I recommend uh, going back and finishing up all the fours, and then transitioning to some of the most useful five letter words. Generally, in terms of words that are shorter than bingos, you're not going to be getting a 50 point bonus. So the longer they get, the less useful they become because they're a little bit less likely to actually appear on the board. You're going to see twos and threes happen over and over again, but specific fives don't come up all that often. Uh, some of them come up a lot more often than others, and those are the uh, ones I've sort of labeled the useful fives. And then after that, I generally recommend uh, diving a little bit deeper into the, the bingos before uh, finally finishing out all of the fives and some of the useful six letter words. And uh, as you can see, basically the first 11 rows of this table are what I'll be going over in detail in this series, and that consists of about 25,000 words. Now, this might sound like a lot of words, but it's actually a pretty small fraction of all of the two through eight letter words in the Scrabble dictionary, which are the most useful words. Now, there are about 90,000 two through eight letter words in the Scrabble dictionary. So the 25,000 words I've highlighted here are actually a fairly significant minority of these words. However, I can guarantee you that if you learn and have a pretty solid grasp on these 25,000 words, you'll very quickly see a rise in your Scrabble ability and you should be able to become uh, an intermediate or maybe advanced tournament player. If you do want to become a top player, then you will very likely need to eventually get to these remaining 65,000 words in the bottom entry of this table. However, in this series, I'll be pretty much just focusing on the first 25,000 as that's already quite a big undertaking in and of itself. I do want to talk about some of the definitions like power tiles, valdumps, and probability I have in this table. And let's start with power tiles and valdumps. So when I am talking about a word that has power tiles, I'm saying it contains at least one of the J, Q, X, and Z. And there are two reasons why it's really useful to know these words. Number one, of course, is scoring a lot of points. I can't tell you how many times I've played a word like Geon, J-E-O-N, or Zoea, Z-O-E-A, for like 60 or 70 points, or another similarly short word that I would only know from Scrabble that has one of these tiles, and it's uh, extremely satisfying and also just a great way to maximize the value of these tiles. It's also important to know these words, and sometimes you really want to get rid of these tiles, especially the Q. So if you know the word CAID, Q-A-I-D, that can often make the difference between being saddled with the Q for a long time and being able to play it off. The next set that's really important are vowel dumps. It can be really, really frustrating to have a rack like five or six vowels, and if you don't know words like aurei, A-U-R-E-I, and olea, O-L-E-A, it can often be really, really hard to get rid of these tiles without making a shorter play or having to exchange and score zero points. So I always find these words to be really, really useful to know, and there aren't too many of them, so they aren't too hard to learn. 
Now, in terms of probability, uh, you'll recall that I mentioned probability when I was discussing bingos on my previous slide. And basically what I mean by this is the likelihood that the word will actually occur during a game or the likelihood that you'll actually draw the word out of a full bag of tiles. So in Scrabble, we typically talk about probability with lower numbers being more likely words to occur and higher numbers being less likely words to occur. And it's all relative to the number of words of that length. So for instance, if we look at sevens, there are just about 25,000 sevens. So probability number one would be the most likely seven to occur, and probability number 25,000 would be the least likely seven to occur. So as an example, sardine is about probability 100. So it's one of the most likely sevens to occur. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? Because look at the letters in sardine. They all occur with large frequency in the bag. You have AEI, one of each of those, which are the most common tiles, and R and N each occur six times, D and S each occur four times. So you don't have any tiles that occur three or fewer times in the bag. All of these tiles are very, very common, and words like sardine, if you know these words and similar probability words, will much more quickly enable you to play a lot of bingos than lower probability words like jukebox, which, as you can see down here, is about probability 24,500. So there are only about 500 words that, uh, or seven other words that are less likely to come up than jukebox. And the reason jukebox is so unlikely to come up is because it has a J, a K, and an X, all of which only occur once in the bag. So the odds that you're actually going to have all three of those tiles at the same time are extremely small. An example of a more middling probability word would be teacups, which is at probability roughly 10,000. So pretty close to the middle of all the sevens as far as probability goes. And the reason why teacups is somewhere in the middle is it doesn't have any of the power tiles like jukebox that only occur once in the bag, but it does have a C and a P, each of which only occur twice. So that's gonna make it much less likely than something such as sardine that only has tiles that occur four or more times in the bag. So I think hopefully this slide should give folks a general idea of probability and hopefully why it's uh, important to study according to probability. You're just going to have very diminishing returns as you go into the lower probability words since they're simply just not going to come up on your rack as often and you won't get to use them and reap the rewards of your studying nearly as often. And I'll talk about in future videos when I'm actually showing you how to create and study these different word lists how you can filter by probability and power tiles and vowels in Ziziva and Aerolith. Uh, but yeah, I think that concludes this video. So hope you guys found this useful and please join me for the next video in the series where I'll be starting to go down the list and talk about some tips for studying each of the different lists of words that I mentioned in the table earlier in this video, which I will just pull back up here so that you guys can review it uh, before the next video. So uh, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you soon for the next one. Have a good one. Bye-bye.